Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so this video uh, is possibly never going to see the light of day. Um, if it does, just fair warning, this is very different <laughs> from all of my videos prior to this. I don't know if this can work. I honestly don't know if a video on this topic can work with the format of my channel because I'm going to be talking about something very serious and very personal, and I don't know if that can come across. Like, it might look insane <laughs> with the avatar. I don't know, though. Um, I will say, just as by way of introduction, this is a topic I've been, I don't know why, I've been just all week been thinking about the same thing. And today I had a weird timing schedule mishap where I accidentally showed up at work four hours early. Uh, I wasn't supposed to teach until three. I showed up at like 1030. So like actually four and a half hours early. Um, There's just a scheduling miscommunication. And uh, so I had a lot of time to kill. And I decided uh, to sit down and just write down the thoughts that have been going through my head for the past week. And uh, I don't know what was really has inspired these thoughts. I probably, probably is a result of all of the comments that you get about things like, oh, woke of time. And, oh, you just like it because there's, you just like wheel of time because there's black people and it's all about representation with you people and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of comments like that. And I don't know. I don't know if that's what inspired this video. But yeah, I will say uh, no spoilers in this video. I'm not even going to be talking about the Wheel of Time. Um, I guess, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> the, <laughs> the theme song is going to feel really weird here. But here you go. <laughs> let's go. Let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy. As I said, there are people who are dismissing the representation in the Wheel of Time, saying that it's, you know, it's just pandering. It doesn't matter, whatever. And I'm just going to say, I, I don't really think that there's a lot of intentionality behind it. I think that uh, Rafe and all of those, you know, the casting director, they just set a wide net and didn't put racial limitations on who they cast, with the exception of Rand. And... I think that's great. I think that's great. I like the idea of colorblind casting. But if there was some intentionality in it, then that's great too. Because what I'm going to talk about today is is representation and how it matters. That's a catchphrase. It's a catchphrase that is said so much these days that it has kind of lost all meaning. Uh, but for me, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's, it's a reality. It's a reality because I can look at my life and see with absolute clarity what the lack of representation stole from me. The years, decades, really, of my life that I wasted because of what not seeing a representation of what was possible did to me. To explain this, I have to go back. Uh, my first memory of knowing that I was gay was when I was nine years old. Uh, one of my classmates called another classmate a homo, and I distinctly remember having the thought, oh, that's right, I gotta keep this a secret. And so as part of keeping that a secret, I learned to pretend to have crushes on boys. I remember even being very, very calculated about it, thinking, okay, I won't pick the boys that all the other girls like. I'll pick someone a little different. That way, you know, it's more believable. And I don't, won't have to worry about not reacting the same way all the other girls do because everyone will know I just like a different kind of boy. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times in videos, but I, just to reinforce it here, the home that I grew up in was, was very religious, like to the point that it's actually kind of hard to convey the extent to which we were religious. We went to church several times a week. Uh, we woke up early every day uh, to pray together, me and my mom, uh, for like an hour. Did that all the way through like to the end of high school. Uh, there was speaking in tongues, laying out of hands, Bible verses were memorized, devotions were held. It It is honestly almost impossible to overstate how much religion was a part of my growing up. Uh, when I was 10, all the other kids in my Sunday school class were uh, signed up to get baptized, and I wouldn't sign up. Week after week, the Sunday school teacher would ask, and week after week, I refused. Uh, 
my Sunday school teacher must have told my mom about it because um, one night she just asked me and I tried to put her off, but she was persistent. And eventually she started to get angry that I would not participate in this, you know, fairly essential sacrament of our faith. And I remember her becoming increasingly desperate, just yelling, like, why, why won't you do this? I couldn't say it out loud. So I found a piece of paper and in the tiniest, tiniest letters that I could make, I wrote it down wrote down, I I can't get baptized because I'm a homosexual. I didn't know the word lesbian at the time. Uh, I was so terrified, you see, because I truly, truly believed in my faith. And I was scared that if I got baptized while being gay, something horrible would happen to me. Didn't know what, but something horrible. I don't remember exactly what my mom said, uh, but she did send me for prayer counseling with a man that I still know. Actually, I went to dinner at his house the last time I was in Canada. Uh, Looking back, as an adult, I can understand what happened during those counseling sessions, but 10-year-old me, 10-year-old Jenny, did not understand. Now, I can look back and see that this man was operating under the assumption that, that homosexuality was a sexual perversion, that it was all about sex. So, he talked about sex to a 10-year-old girl. It was gross. It was incredibly uncomfortable. Sex was disgusting to me because I was 10 and I was innocent. I I barely knew what sex was. And I literally had no concept of what sex between women even meant. I just knew that girls were enticing. And these two girls, Anne Christine, Kimberly, (laughs) they, they were in my class. And I wanted to hold their hands and I wanted to touch their hair. And I liked it when they smiled. And I got butterflies when they smiled at me. But this man, he made it all so disgusting. He kept talking about sexual fantasies and and masturbation. And eventually I told him that I was just, I was better to make it end. But of course, it wasn't better. Uh, I just learned to hide it better. Uh, Even for myself, I would concoct more elaborate stories about the boys that I I, I liked. One of whom actually shares a first and last name with a uh, recently discovered very prolific serial killer. (laughs) Which makes it doubly funny these days when my mom brings him up as proof that I was I was healed, quote unquote, from homosexuality as a child. And she'll say, but you were in love with for all of your teen years. And I'll go like, no, what? What the f- ah! Oh, you mean the boy from junior high, not the serial killer. Anyway, my, my quest for a cure didn't stop. I, uh, throughout my teens, I would find people to pray for me, always visiting preachers, visiting faith healers, people who didn't know me or my mom or anyone that I knew. I even once uh, found a way to go see a faith healer on my own, like without my mom, uh, to ask him to, like, I wanted to be exorcised. Like, I, I don't know how to use that as a verb, but I like to to get rid of a demon <laughs> inside of me, like the demon of homosexuality. That was... That was a life experience, one that I would not wish on anyone, and I do not want to repeat. Uh, But anyway, none of it worked, of course. I heard about a program called Exodus, uh, a Christian program that claimed to be able to cure homosexuality. Uh, Exodus was, at one point, the largest gay conversion program in North America, possibly the world, I'm not sure. Uh, They were covered on the news. Their success stories showed up uh, as guests on, on talk shows, which I'm sure is how I heard about it. So I came up with a new plan. My plan was to just survive, get through high school, then go to university, then get a job, and then I can save up enough money to go to Exodus and then become straight, and then no one else in my life would ever have to know. In the summer, between grade 11 and 12, uh, the church that we were attending at that time held, held a massive outreach. Gosh, it's so hard to talk about my childhood without using Christian terms that might be completely incomprehensible to people who aren't Christians uh, or didn't grow up into that environment. But we planned it. It was a, an outreach, a mission, whatever to our city. And as part of this event, like people were brought in from all over the country, all over North America, really, uh, to, you know, be a part of this. And when they arrived, uh, each of them gave like a a brief introduction and and testimony from uh, the pulpit during a church service. One of them, a young man, was one of those Exodus success stories. He had been cured of his homosexuality. After they introduced themselves, uh, the pastor asked for volunteers to help uh, these people like navigate the city, you know, basically accompany them as we harassed or proselytized, evangelized 
uh, to people on the street. I don't think I've ever volunteered for anything so quickly. I made mental preparations for how to subtly ask him about Exodus, uh, how, how it worked, how he knew that he was cured. I, I, <laughs> I wanted to know everything, but I needn't have bothered. He, he talked about almost nothing else. That was constantly talked about his experience at Exodus and his freedom from homosexuality. I, I spent the better part of a week with him, but <laughs> within three days, it had become painfully clear to me that this man was still gay. The way he talked about men, his uh, last boyfriend, who he had been with for a couple of years, uh, the way he constantly, constantly pointed out men to me that he would have been into if he was still gay. It, it was just so clear to me that all that had happened to him was that he had stopped having sex with men. That was the sum total of Exodus's promise to help you to not have same-sex relationships. I remember that hitting me like a, a punch in the gut because I didn't need help with that. I was already doing that. I don't know if you know this, it is remarkably easy to not have sex. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> but if all they had to offer was help doing something that I was already doing, then what, what good was Exodus? Exodus, by the way, has completely fallen apart. Its founders and the people who led it for years have finally admitted that they are gay and have, you know, acknowledged and taken responsibility for the uh, incredible harm that they caused to so many people. There's a whole documentary about it on Netflix. But anyway, uh, that plan was foiled. So now I had no hope. I do remember a few times, like, through this period of, of tentatively, tentatively trying to, to come out, you know, telling people who were safe. And by safe, I mean people who didn't know me. <laughs> like, I would start a new job and tell one coworker who didn't know any of my friends or family. And, but it was always, always very temporary. And I always dove back into the closet every single time. I, I graduated from high school and went to university, joined a Christian club on campus. And, uh, I include this part of the story because what I did during this time was its probably the weirdest, most pointless, most inexplicable thing I've ever done in my entire life. And I did it for years. And I don't think I've actually ever told anybody about it. Maybe I have, but I don't remember anybody I've told about it because it was so dumb. And I can't believe I'm putting this in a video because <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of humiliating. Uh, okay. So, the Christian club I was a part of was an official club on campus, and as such, we had permission to to put up posters or like a weekly, you know, letter-sized paper announcement uh, about our club once a week. And I, that was my job. Like, I volunteered for that as part of the club. I would be the one to put up the posters. So once a week, I would go to every building on campus, and there was designated bulletin boards, and I would put up our poster on the bulletin board. One week, I did it a little later than I, I normally did. And uh, when I went to hang out my poster, I saw a poster for a lesbian club. I remember it was called Women, spelled W-O-M-Y-N, and it had those, like, two female, uh, you know, gender symbols, and they were intertwined with each other. And I remember standing there in the hallway just staring at it for, like, probably a minute, maybe less, but I stared at it for a while. And then I hung my poster right next to it. And then I went around to all the buildings on campus and I did the same thing. Hung my poster right next to the lesbian club poster. The next week, I intentionally waited until uh, later in the day to hang my posters and the lesbian club posters were already up. And so I did it again. I did that every week. <laughs> Sometimes there wouldn't be room next to their poster. But if I was alone, like if there was nobody in the hallway at the time, I would take down the other posters. I, I wouldn't remove them. I would take them. I, I would move them so that there was room beside the lesbian club poster so I could put my poster next to it. I think they must have noticed because like, initially, by the way, like the lesbian club poster was always in the same spot on the board. But uh, after a while, like a couple of months, maybe I think they started to get annoyed by this and they started to vary where they hung their poster and they would hang them sometimes later on in the day. Uh, they tried sometimes putting them like way at the top of the bullet board and I'm very short, so it was very hard to reach. But I always did it. I always found it. And it, unless it was actually like impossible, my poster was always beside theirs. I did that for three years. And to this day, I don't really understand what it was that I was doing. After university, I took uh, a year 
and went to live in Ireland. Uh, and I think a year away from just the context of my upbringing was what I needed. On my 25th birthday, not intentional at all, but it was my birthday, I finally just gave up. I, I finally decided I have to accept who I am. I'm gay. Can't change it. I was just going to have to work out how to reconcile who I knew I was with my faith, which that was the thing that I was having trouble with. The thing that I had constantly heard is you have to choose between, you know, God and sin. And the frustration was the sin that I believed that I had of being gay was something that I had been trying to change and couldn't. And I, I, it was, it's not a choice. I, it's, it's not a valid choice of one of those things you can't change and one of them you can. That's not, you can change your religion. Uh, anyway, all of this to say, I, that's what I decided. I'm just going to have to figure out how to be the two at the same time. This wasn't a traditional coming out, by the way. I think I told exactly one person, uh, my friend Paul, who was also gay himself. Weirdly enough, I will say, this is just, I, despite the incredible conservative and intense religion I grew up in, I was never homophobic. I, I remember even standing up for a, a girl who came out when I was in high school, very, very brave, because I was the like early 90s, possibly late, no, early 90s. And she came out and everybody bullied her and I stood up for her. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I did that. It doesn't make sense. Like when I think about how the environment I grew up in, I should have been homophobic, but I wasn't. So yay, I guess. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, um, yeah. So I had a gay friend and I told him. Uh, I will say I did not try to date women. I All this was, all this coming out was, was I just determined that I would not deny my feelings anymore. I would not lie to myself anymore. <laughs> Sorry. I would just let myself feel what I felt. This may not sound like much, but it was, it was huge for me. I, I felt like I could finally breathe. Years later, I remember telling one of my pastors that what it felt like was that I had spent my entire life swimming against the current and, and gotten absolutely nowhere. Everything I tried to do didn't work because I was pushing against this incredible force. And then one day I just, I turned around and all of a sudden, all of the struggling, all of the paddling, all of the, anything I did, it actually worked. I could actually move. And that was enough for me for a while, for about maybe five years, just being honest with myself, that was enough. I didn't, I didn't need anything more. But like I said, it was for a while. Eventually I began to chafe on this too. I began to feel like I was lying to everyone around me all the time. Uh, this was why I eventually told my pastors and then my friends and my mother found out about it at some point uh, during this time as well. And it is worth noting, let me just say, during all of this time, I had not ever, like until this point, I'd never dated, kissed, or even held hands with a woman. All I was doing at this point was being honest with myself and now with other people about who I was. Allowing myself to actually be with women, that was still a few years off. I've told all of these stories about myself just to try and explain, to, to articulate what to me was a very basic and foundational belief that I had that I never once, not even for like an instant, questioned. And that belief was that it was impossible to be a Christian, a true Christian, and be gay. The amount of time that I spent, the amount of time that I, I wasted because of this belief, if I think about it too much, it, it depresses me. My life would have been so different if at any point between the age of nine and 30, if this belief had been challenged in any way. Which is where I finally come to the point of this. Representation. Representation matters. Last year, I finally got around to watching The Expanse, and anyone who has watched The Expanse probably knows what I'm going to say right now. In the third season of The Expanse, there's a character named Anna, who is a lesbian, and she's happily married, and she has a child, and she's a pastor. She's a Christian pastor. And her faith feels sincere and true. The way she thinks and talks about her faith feels familiar, even more so in the books than in the show. And 
they the authors must have had like they must have talked to actual Christians or people who grew up in the Christian world because like it, it feels real. It's <laughs> My one beef, or my one problem, I should say, with Firefly is that it is very, very clear when I watch it that the character of Book was written by somebody who was not a Christian. Like, it just, he doesn't talk or act or think like any Christian I've ever met in my life. And it just comes across as, oh, this is what an atheist thinks Christians are. Anna feels real. That when I was, like, when you're in her mind in the books, her thoughts, I, I could see myself in her. Now, I I should say this, because <laughs> I've been talking about religion a lot. I, I do need to clarify. I am not personally religious anymore. And despite what all of this backstory may make it sound like, the shift in my beliefs had really very, very little to do with my sexuality. Other life stuff, other life events and experiences and whatever, they happened and my beliefs changed. Um, but my roots are still my roots. And Christianity uh, is still like the foundation on which I grew up. And it still holds a lot of beauty for me. As weird as it may sound, there are times I actually miss it. I miss my faith. Watching season three of The Expanse, I, I can't remember what episode it was, but I remember having to... Oh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry, it's happening even just talking about it. I remember having to stop an episode in the middle because I was sobbing. Not because of anything that was happening in the plot, but because of, because of Anna. Just the existence of Anna, and because, because of the absolute certainty that I felt in my bones, like I knew it with, with, I knew it, that if I had seen a character like Anna in any form of media that I had taken during those years, that my life would be different now. Anna would have shown me that something that I had believed with all of my being was impossible. Seeing her would have shown me that it was possible, that it could exist. I was sobbing in grief for the time that I had lost. <laughs> time that I had thrown away. I had spent more than I'd spent more than twenty years of my life. Twenty years of isolation, depression, suicidal thoughts, fear for my immortal soul. Twenty years of my life trying to figure something out that one hour of television could have solved for me. I was also sobbing in relief and joy for the kids coming up now who have a character like Anna to help them see the the possibilities of what their life can be. I I cannot even begin to guess what my life would have been like if I had seen an Anna during those years. I just know that it would be different and And if I'm honest, I believe it would have been better. I believe I would have had a much better life. Which both depresses me, but gives me hope. At the same time. So, when I say representation matters, this, this isn't just a catchphrase for me. It's a fact. It matters. It's more than just the positive, happy feelings. It's more than boosting self-esteem. It's more than the beauty of diversity. Representation can show you things you didn't believe to be possible. Representation can make you question things you never thought to question. It can question, cause you to question the limits that you put on yourself, the limits that other people put on you. It's powerful. So these people in my comments who say things like, you know, oh, you just like it because you only like it because as if representation was a small thing, you don't know. And the fact that you can't see it is a, A, it's a sign of your privilege, but 
the fact that you don't even want to see it is a sign of a a cold heart. It's a sign that says you don't care that somebody might need to see it because you don't know. I strongly doubt that uh, the team of writers who wrote The Expanse or the actress who played Anna thought, oh, this this character could change someone's life. It was just a character. But it could have it could have changed my life if it had come earlier. And that's not an indictment, not it's not that the book should have come out earlier. It's a fantastic book. Read it. Uh or a series of books. But it's important. Representation is important. You've had it your whole life, you don't know. And that's good for you, yay. But don't try to take it from other people, because you don't know. And I guess uh, that's it. I'm going to have to check and see if this looks so stupid with a cartoon. Uh, so I guess I will end this here. Um, I feel weird saying this, but I will have links in the description for Discord and Patreon and all that, so check it out. And I guess I will end this here. Please like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.